I can't make a video on my favorite Souls-like games and not deliver a follow-up on the best bosses they have to offer. I've done rankings for a number of games in that video, but today is all about adding it up to the all-time greats of this offbeat subgenre. My only stipulation is one boss per game, no more, no less. So if you haven't seen my video on the top 10 best Souls likes, be sure to give it a look to know what games I'm working from. Also, be sure to stick around to the end for an announcement on a long-requested video I'm sure you'll be interested in. With all that out of the way, here are my top 10 best Souls-like bosses. Number 10, Our Lady of the Charred Visage, Blasphemous. Though I'm a glutton for the unholy punishment Blasphemous has to offer, its bosses are hit or miss on the whole. Tossing the garbage in that heap, we get a stepping stone to the true gems, capped off by this Andros-inspired monstrosity. What this lady lacks in physical beauty, it makes up for in tight mechanical design. The combat in Blasphemous on a surface level is simple, jump and dash to evade, then slash with your sword during openings. 2D games like this often boil the difficulty of finding those openings down to taking up space on screen. Our Lady does this through a gradual crescendo of lasers, balls, and teleporting that can increase or decrease the margin for error in a randomized way that depends on the attack she dishes out and how skillfully you respond. The laser shots from her hands are consistent pressure, but relatively easy to avoid. With proper baiting, this can be used to your advantage. The Electric Orb Railfire is more intense, requiring you to focus almost entirely on evasion, unless she chooses to fire it in the plus pattern instead of waving it across the screen in a consistent burst. It'll spin in an attempt to win, leaving openings for adept escape artists. Finally, the glowing balls blast directly towards you, but can be reflected for bonus damage with great timing. This all makes for a wonderfully balanced battle that gets amplified dramatically when both hands enter the fray. The pandemonium it creates makes each hit that much more satisfying until the sweet victorious finale. A spark of boss euphoria well worth a spot on today's list. Number 9, The Timekeeper, Dead Cells. Quick disclaimer to say I've yet to play the Bad Seed DLC, so my take is based on the release version of the game. Of the modest boss roster it offered, I have to give my nod to the final line of defense for the endgame. The Timekeeper is far and away the most basic boss on the list, but that matches the nature of Dead Cells combat. Instead of having an extensive moveset, your foes in Dead Cells execute a small number of attacks at an alarming rate. Keeper is no different, with his teleports, grapples, quick slashes, omega dashes, and shuriken spin, all of which is compounded by regularly falling swords in the second phase. In the same way Blasphemous makes an effort to load your screen with danger, the Keeper relies on speedy mix-ups and a busy environment to put you in a tough position. Your out is the meaty build that you bring to the table. Dead Cells diversity in builds from explosive melee-focused warriors to devastating archers to trap-tossing shinobi gives each battle at the top of the clock tower a unique flavor. This is typically the point where your build has fully come together for the run, and this thrilling battle is the perfect test to see how ready it is for the final challenges to come. Number 8, Delver, The Surge 2 As I mentioned in both the boss ranking and my best souls like game video, The Surge 2 is a great game with craptastic bosses. Despite most of them being lukewarm punching bags, Delver brings fantastic design to the table in a way that has me staring at the developers saying, this? This right here? More of this please! The multiple phases that are differentiated strongly from one another are a big selling point. The first phase is a basic, somewhat slow melee monster. He'll slap you around a few times, do a lunge forward, and dig underground for a few whack-a-mole moments. All of these have fair tells in counter windows. It can be a lot of fun testing the limits of your advantageous moments heading toward phase 2. Your windows here are generally more limited as the previous moveset picks up speed in this feral configuration. The boss hops around the arena a lot faster and adds some ranged moves into the mix. These distance shots are great though because if timed well, you can damage them to do permanent damage to the boss's health, a better option than tangoing with its speed up close. The final phase is a more tanky alternative that does easy to bait charges and shockwaves. While they are easy to dodge at first, the shockwave after effects force you to be careful of your footing. This part does feel the most uneventful since baiting its lunge is pretty easy. At least the layers of destroying armor on specific body parts for heftier damage is still present. It's by no stretch of the mind a world beater that redefines the meaning of a boss battle, but it's a very well executed and creative fight that makes the most of the Surge 2's mechanics. A battle that is handily the finest in the game. Number 7, Judgment, Hyperlight Drifter. If you've noticed how many times I've used this scene across my videos, you'll recognize the silhouette of Judgment, Hyperlight Drifter's final battle. Everything from the slow tension built as you ride down the long elevator to the grotesque opening before the fight begins sets the stage brilliantly. 
These unnerving moments of peace are quickly upended by the bullet hell judgment rains down upon you. Like Blasphemous in Dead Cells, map placement in the top down arena is key to evasion. He'll mix in charges, flame breath, 360 AoE bursts of laser orbs, asterisk shaped tendrils firing outward, capped off with periodic disappearing acts to create four breakable boxes tracking you. You need to quickly break off as many as you can or suffer a slam down effect that covers a wide range around each. Like those other 2D battles, this is very much about balancing the many things Judgment mixes together with proper evasion and offense. Mastery of the Drifter's limited dashes is vital, as is mixing ranged attacks to make the most of the minuscule downtime Judgment offers. I have to admit that my adoration for this boss above its peers relates as much to its position in the story, the art surrounding it, and the terrifying music as it does the actual fight itself. It may actually be the weakest fight by a hair on today's list, but the full package is a remarkable end to one of my most beloved games. Number 6, Ninth Sister, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. The Fallen Order bosses are lumped into a high tier of lightsaber duels and everything else a step below. Except for Gorgara, that fight is an exceptional example of a large beast boss done right. But despite my love for the big bat, Nine Sister is consistently the most memorable for me. Not necessarily because it's league above the battles with Trilla or Malakos mechanically, but your abilities at this point aren't quite as OP as in the endgame, with the slow and dual saber combo being effective to a broken degree. With no dual saber ability against the Nine Sister, her battle gets a shine in all of its balanced glory. She has a number of different combos you can deflect, force pushes to periodically throw a wrench in your rhythm, and has unblockable charges, leaps, and swipes that require light quick switches from deflects to dodges. The second phase of the dual sided saber adds more deadly combos and tighter deflect windows, but you have solid tools of your own with slow and more agile evasion to match your brutish combat style. The design is top notch and makes the most of Fallen Order's combat before you become an unstoppable force. The overall boss design in this game has me giddy to see what Respawn can come up with in future entries with more time in the oven. For now, Nine Sister takes the cake as Fallen Order's finest battle, enough to earn her a spot just outside the top 5 best souls like bosses. Number 5, Zillis, Remnant from the Ashes. Of all the bosses on today's list, this is by far the most unique. That's thanks to this fight maximizing what is possible within Remnant's range combat in comparison to this melee centric genre. Instead of fighting on a level plane, this boss will hover above a precarious bridge you're perched on. I say precarious only because if you aren't careful about your footing, you can get knocked off. This is an important note to make because it characterizes the pressure Zillis builds. Much like the 2D fights lower on the list, this fight is all about taking up space. It'll toss out corrosion orbs and leave a cloud after effect for a short time, it slices through vertically and horizontally with its spear, finally it summons homing orbs that you have to shoot out of the air before they reach you. Mixing these three attacks together limits your space and options, but there's plenty of downtime to work with. This changes once the boss charges a scream that brings in its doppelganger. The scream is crucial to success for a few reasons. First, the amount of damage that the boss takes in this charge state is gargantuan. Second, dishing this damage out is essential if you don't want to be wiped by the scream, as each shriek does half your health after the charge, an instant kill if they both cry out. Lastly, this indicates a split in their strategy. One of the bugs will maintain the previous actions while the other sits in wait. It'll eventually come up behind you and fire large beams. These beams sweep slowly across the bridge, so you're forced to note where they are and eventually cross to safety. Awareness of your positioning, the boss's behavior, and consistent offense are all important to coming out on top, but it's balanced flawlessly. The passive versus active nature of the duo makes it possible for a fight with blind spots to work. I think that's quite an achievement considering how much this genre can struggle with that sort of split attention. The phenomenally executed mechanics make the battle all the more entertaining, an exciting match well worth a spot in the top 5. Number 4, Skull King, Code Vein. Like Dead Cells, I have to disclaim that I never got the Code Vein DLCs, mainly because I heard they were disappointingly short dives into the depths. There were at least new bosses at their core, but I haven't faced them, so I can't consider them for this list. Not that they were likely to beat out the King of Code Vein's boss quality anyway. If there's any single boss on today's list that feels the closest to a battle from Dark Souls itself, it's this wolf-clad warrior. Similar to bosses like Nameless King or Fume Knight, Skull King is all about deceptive speed with delayed offbeat tells that can make dodging a nightmare. He's beefy enough that you can't attack wildly, you need to react accordingly to each move he dishes out, and it's quite the wide arsenal. Wide not only in terms of move pool, but how long his swings last. As he goes through his successively more aggressive phases, his dual sword attacks begin lagging one behind the other. 
making it very easy to dodge the first sword, but lose your iframes before you're clear of the second. He mixes in charges with his barking pauldrons, an attack that prevents you from playing keep away. This is a fight that forces you to block or properly evade and manage all of the difficulties that come along with it. You do at least get a few staggers and longer stuns as the fight progresses, but it's matched with the aforementioned aggressive later phases that have magic after effects on his weapons and twists on previous combos to throw you off. It takes quite an effort to learn and react to all he can dish out and string it together effectively enough to claim victory. If this list were solely based on which boss emulates the exact formula Soul's boss follows the best, then Skull King would get top honors. Ranking him for his overall quality in general, however, leaves him with a very commendable number four nod. Number three, Otake Maru Neo 2. Fighting the main antagonist in Neo 2's surprisingly high quality roller coaster of a story is a fantastic conclusion to the arc, both in terms of story significance and a killer battle. With your character being a half demon that can harness three different styles, brute, feral, and phantom, Otakemaru's design centers around randomized mix up in his mechanics that are based around all of these forms. Brute packs a mean punch with alarming speed, but does leave bigger gaps for you to unload. Feral is ridiculously quick, but has a few leaps you can bait for good windows. Phantom is a ranged terror, but offers its own counter opportunities. I'm putting more focus on your ability to counter than the specific moves of each, because it's less about each individual move, and instead how you'll react to the quick changes between these styles. His shakeups are reminiscent of your ability to maximize offense through stance changes, plus the demonic tools you've come to rely on, such as the yokai counter, and abilities such as summoning good old Oniroki for a spin to win. The trio of Demon Hot Potato is merely a prelude to his true self, a humanoid warrior that can dish out attacks from all three types, as well as some terrifying ones of his own like the unlimited bladework style sword barrage. If you made it this far, you've likely settled into a lethal playstyle of your own and are adept at making the most of the tools available to you. Like so many other bosses on this list, what gives Otakemaru the edge is how well the fight works as a playground to test everything you've learned while having an absolute blast. His mechanics are frenzied, but you have the speed to match. His mix-ups are extensive, but so are the tools at your disposal. His final phase is a brutal challenge, but every second of the game is hard in your skills to be ready to face it. Neo 2's bosses were a remarkable improvement on the originals overall, just like the game itself. Otakemaru leads that quality charge with enough force to crack the top three. Number 2, Nightmare King Grim Hollow Knight. It feels silly to be talking about Grimm's quality so soon after making a full ranking of the Hollow Knight boss quality. Come to think of it, he's made appearances in quite a few videos across the channel, including the best bosses of the last decade. Though my opinions change slightly over time relative to videos like that, as you're soon to see, my faith in Grimm's quality will never waver. Grimm's moveset is distilled to absolute perfection in the form of six attacks. He'll fire an offset group of four bats high and low that you can dash through with a razor thin timing for a punish. He'll dive kick from above at an angle, then sweep leaving a fire after effect. He'll dash towards you with an uppercut that leaves an arc of fireballs in its wake. He spawns an imposing number of tail spikes throughout the arena, he floats airborne while blasting you with four fire pillars in quick succession, and as each quarter of his HP is shaved, he'll stoke the flame all over in the form of fireball spam high and low. Each of these attacks has a clear punish opportunity for those skilled enough to take advantage, and at the very least offer reliable ways to evade. This battle is all about practicing until the point you reach Ultra Instinct. When I battle Grimm, I don't think, just react. Everything happens so quickly, but once you get used to his tells, you'll react within a second. The arduous climb to reach that skill ceiling was one of the more difficult challenges I've taken on in the last few years, but it's a peak well worth reaching. But the true peak of today's list is Ishin, the Sword Saint, Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice. An appropriate segue considering his place within the climax of Sekiro's story. I'm still blown away by the commenters that pointed out Sekiro's gradual de-rust and honing his confidence with Kusabi Maru. At first, you see his hand roll off the hilt as he scrambles to find his grasp when meeting Genichiro's eyes. At the second encounter, he'll pull it out slowly but firmly. In the final showdown, he pulls it out like it's an extension of himself in preparation to cut Kenichiro down, which he swiftly does. Unfortunately, his dying act is to summon a youthful Ishin in top form with the sole wish that he continue the Ashina line. In respect of his wish, Ishin does battle with Sekiro in one of the most breathtaking duels I've ever had the pleasure of taking part in. The beginning is a methodical battle with a samurai that mixes in a few forceful wind darts. Once Ishin sees your resolve through his first phase though, he pulls the spear from the intro cutscene out of the ground 
around and becomes an offset dual wielder. Oh, and he has a pistol too. This phase is unadulterated chaos. If you thought bosses like Skull King had off-tempo rhythms and tight windows to match, Ishin marches to the beat of his own insanely feral drum. I've spent hours upon hours practicing this fight for speedrunning purposes, and though there are certain AI loops you can somewhat reliably bait him into, once he decides to unleash the beast, I'm lucky if I can even consistently deflect half of what he dishes out. Sometimes I consider knocking his desperate use of lightning in the third phase because it trivializes the challenge to a degree, but I usually shut up in grateful favor of the reprieve. Much like Atake Maru, Ishin tests every single ounce of what you've learned throughout your time with the game, and as with Grimm, he dishes out a slim arsenal of offensive blistering speeds that makes it fairly designed, but he goes further beyond with his chaotic rhythm to make it nearly inhuman to be able to react perfectly to his assaults 100% of the time even with hours of practice. That immense care put into balancing every bit of his difficulty with your health revive, heals, prosthetics, sugar buffs, and wealth of skill to lean on makes this another amusement park of adrenaline packed into a single boss arena. It's not only one of the best souls like bosses, he's one of the best bosses of all time. But of course, that's just my opinion. If you're a lover of Sekiro, it's time to share yours in a long requested ranking. In a continuation of my area ranking series for FromSoft titles, you now have a chance to vote on the best and worst areas Sekiro has to offer. Check the link in the description for the survey to cast your vote on the quality of Sekiro's 12 areas. I've divided them according to the wiki, so be sure to check the link if you're unsure of how things are split. Leave a comment below on the areas for a chance to be featured in that video, and be sure to subscribe for that and more rankings to come. And of course, I want to thank you for watching today, much love to you, and I'll see you in the next video.